Welcome everybody to the exit seminar for Alexis Robert Prince. Lots of people here, I'm very happy to see, especially Alexis. <laughs> <laughs> I want you to know that we're joined by Alexis's parents. Um, Alexis has one of the most supportive families I've ever seen in academia, quite honestly. Um, I promised her that I would keep this to less than 20 minutes. <laughs> so I want to tell you only a couple of things about Alexis that I'm going to let her fantastic research speak for itself, her seminar. The first thing I want to tell you about is that remember when you were a graduate student, you wrote a dissertation proposal, got it through your qualifying exam committee and People approved it and you went off and you did your research and you get to the very end of it and the dissertation hardly looks anything like that proposal. <laughs> Alexis is a rare example in my experience of somebody who did almost exactly what she said she was going to do. She wrote this proposal, very strong, defended it, then went out and executed the mission. And the reason I think this is important to point out is that when you think about the reasons why that almost never happens. There's two common things that happen. One of them is that somewhere along the line, something happens in your research that distracts you and you realize that there's something more exciting over here and you make a great discovery <laughs> and you become really famous. Another possibility is that you hit what's called the hard basket. You, hear, you run into things that are difficult to do and you take the easy way around. You find some other pathway that of least resistance is you just decide you're not up to that good challenge. Everybody in the room can decide which one of these happened to you in your dissertation. <laughs> um, and in Alexis's case, it's because you know, the reason that she got there and, and executed what she said she would do is because she's an incredibly focused, determined person. She does what she said she's going to do. When she commits to something, she really does an amazing job. And, and I think it, this little sort of anecdote tells you a lot about this person and sort of what she's all about. The other thing I want to tell you about a little bit is in her years here at UC Davis, Alexis has been an incredible contributor to the DEI mission of the entire university. And I want to read you just a, a little bit, just a few of the side jobs that she's had while she's been a graduate student. I would say that she's probably put 25% mm, of her time, maybe, maybe more. <laughs> She's been very devoted to these efforts and very uh, effective and influential. Most recently, she was one of the graduate advisors to the C CBS Dean for D Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Um, that is associated with several things that she did as uh, in that capacity. She was on the Population Biology Admissions Committee as a student representative. She was co-director and primary conference coordinator the Diversity and STEM Coalition at UC Davis for two or three years. And she was the inaugural program chair for the Ecology and Evolution Program School Preview Day that is run by the graduate students in the in Population Biology Graduate Group that has continued to this day and has become a phenomenon, I guess is the best way to put it. I'll stop there, but there's like four more lines of things that she's done. <laughs> And I think if you've ever had a conversation with Alexis about this topic, you realize that she really knows a lot about it. She's really somebody who intends to make, an, a, make a difference in this area. And I have no doubt in my mind when she goes on eventually to a faculty position in academia that this is going to be a big part of, um, a big part of what she does. The research of Alexis. <laughs> I'm really excited to be here today. Thank you to Peter for that introduction. Um, I'm kicking off a nearly quarter long series of uh, QE seminars and exit seminars by our pop bio students. 
So again, my name is Alexis Roberts Hedges, and today we're gonna to start this series off by talking about fish. So fishes are super diverse and just incredibly beautiful organisms. You can see an assortment of fishes on this slide. They occupy a variety of freshwater and marine habitats. They have different body shapes, sizes, colors, there's different predator defenses and a bunch of other adaptations. And this list could go on and on. And researchers have been spending years just trying to disentangle how fishes have accumulated so much of this diversity. And in raven fishes specifically, which is a group that accounts for over 50% of living vertebrate species, uh, people often point to functional innovations. And a functional innovation is a trait that enables novel interactions with the environment and other organisms, and it prompts further success within the lineage that it evolved in. And some examples of these traits include things like fin spines, uh, which can double the size of an organism and reduce its number of potential predators like we see in this butterfly fish. You have things like air breathing, which I'm, I'm highlighting this gunnel <laughs> here. Uh, it allows fishes like the scunnel to live in intertidal zones. Uh, or you can think about things like endothermy and antifreeze proteins that allows fishes to live in cold water or polar regions. And all of these traits have been game changers, but one of the things that I want you to notice is that half of these traits that are on this slide that have been identified are actually morphological traits. And further, three of those four are actually found within the mouth. So there's a potential there to impact uh, fish feeding strategies. Uh, to really understand what fishes are doing when they feed and how these traits can affect these mechanisms, we gotta talk about fish feeding strategies and fishes. Or, yeah, fish feeding <laughs> strategies. <laughs> So there's a lot of variety in these mechanisms, uh, but a majority of fishes use suction feeding to capture their prey. And this process involves a rapid opening of the oral jaws and an expansion of the mouth cavity that creates a negative pressure gradient that sucks in water and the prey item. One of the coolest examples of this process can be seen in a sling jaw wrasse, where we start in this closed mouth position up at the top, and we go all the way to that full expansion down in this last picture. And this is a process that happens in under a second in this fish. In a high speed video format, which allows us to look at this process slow down, this is just striking. The strike is striking. <laughs> <laughs> it's such a rapid and highly coordinated motion. Uh, and I should note that Suction feeding doesn't look this cool in all things. <laughs> I will show you more throughout the talk, but right now I just want you to imagine that you're this tiny little gray fish that is being captured by that suction feeding process. You may have thought that that scary part was over, but it turns out that fishes have a second set of jaws uh, called pharyngeal jaws. And so if you're that little silver fish, you're looking straight down the mouth of that sling jaw wrasse, you're gonna see upper, and lower jaws back behind the mouth cavity. I have them highlighted here in blue. So once that little prey item is captured, the pharyngeal jaws work to crush, tear, break down, transport prey items for further digestion. So the development of this second jaw system really spurred diversification in fishes because it allows the oral and the pharyngeal jaws to be functionally independent. So you have the oral jaws that are doing that prey capture process, and then you have the pharyngeal jaws that are doing prey processing. And this strategy is generally conserved across suction feeding fishes. Uh, but as I mentioned before, morphological innovations within the mouth have the potential to dramatically change not only functional, but the evolutionary dynamics within the feeding system as a whole. So this is the intersection that my research lies at. In that grand scheme of understanding uh, fish diversity, I combine morphology, kinematics, and phylogenetic comparative methods to understand how morphological innovations impact diversification within the feeding system. I'm specifically interested in a couple aspects of diversification, including disparity, 
or the amount of variation in morphological and functional traits across species, uh, rates of evolution or the amount of change in those traits over time, and then the co-evolution of traits or sets of traits. So today I'll be focusing on just some of my work that explores the impact of a pharyngeal jaw innovation on these aspects of diversity. Okay, so what is that pharyngeal jaw innovation? We talked a little bit already about this two jaw system where the oral jaws highlighted in black are doing that prey capturing and the pharyngeal jaws highlighted in bold are doing that prey processing. And focusing on the pharyngeal jaws a bit more, this jaw unit is derived from gill arch elements and it includes paired upper jaw and lower jaw elements that you can see in this anterior medial view. And both of the upper and the lower jaws are actually toothed. And again, they're located behind that mouth cavity. So this is a pretty generic pharyngeal jaw structure that we find throughout ray fish <coughs> fishes. Uh, but there are at least six families that actually evolved a modified or independently evolved a modified pharyngeal jaw. And this configuration is termed pharyngeal but for the sake of this talk, I'm gonna say modified pharyngeal jaw or MPJ. <clears throat> and so these modifications include a fusion of that lower jaw bone so that you have one robust structure. You have a muscular sling that attaches on either side of that lower pharyngeal jaw, and it actually suspends it from the neurocranium that enables greater crushing and grinding forces. And then finally, on the back side of these upper pharyngeal jaws, there's a joint between the base of the neurocranium and the top of those upper pharyngeal jaw components that allows for more mobility. So overall, the MPJ is considered a functional innovation because these changes allow uh, predators to process harder, tougher, chewier prey items, think things like mollusks and algae. And because of the big impact on the functional capacity of the pharyngeal jaws, I'm really interested in understanding if and how these modifications impact those aspects of diversification in the feeding system overall. So we're gonna work through two main questions today, including how does the pharyngeal jaw innovation affect the coevolutionary patterns between the two jaw systems? And how does diversification or how it impacts diversification of oral jaw prey capture strategies. Okay, so jumping into part one, this study looked at if and how the MPJ impacts coevolutionary patterns. Another way to say coevolution or that we talk about coevolution is integration. Integration is a term in evolutionary biology that refers to that correlated evolution of traits or sets of traits. And we can think about this in a biological context like the feeding apparatus, where each jaw unit is composed of multiple musculoskeletal elements that are working in coordination to perform some specific functions. So we can collect measurements characterizing the size, shape, orientation, and even the function of these structures. And then we can compute correlations or, or covariance among these traits within a phylogenetic context to get a sense of how strongly these components are co-evolving. So if we are to find strong covariance uh, among the traits within a single jaw system, we'd say that these systems are strongly evolutionarily integrated. And if we go on to find insignificant correlations among the traits spanning those two systems, then we say that not only are the oral and pharyngeal jaw units functionally independent, but they are also evolutionarily independent from each other. So this phenomenon has been extremely and extensively studied in uh, fishes and other organisms, not only to figure out how functional traits might be co-evolving, but also to understand the relationship between integration and morphological diversification. And so despite these efforts, uh, there's no consensus in how integration impacts uh, morphological diversification. We think about this in the, in the sense of trait variance, 
Some researchers say that integration restricts diversification, and this is really because that inability to explore trait space without compromising the functional integrity of the system. Uh, but others say that integration can facilitate diversification, and they say that this is because there's uh, adaptive co-evolution of an entire system along evolutionary lines of least resistance. So coming back around to that main, that main topic, the main focus here, another consideration here is how functional innovations impact patterns of integration and independence. Because those novel traits can impact an organism's functional capacity, it's really not too hard to believe that they may uh, also impact co-evolution and trait diversification overall. So there's been a lot of energy to understand these dynamics in fishes with the modified pharyngeal jaws. And that interest goes back 50 years to a hypothesis put forth by Carl Lehm, who said that the development of these modifications actually increased the evolutionary independence of the oral and the pharyngeal jaw systems. And he said that that further, that independence allowed for further specialization of the two jaw systems and really supported and gave the fishes the ability to process more diverse prey types. Several studies have examined these patterns in African and neotropical cichlids, which is a very species and diverse family of MPJ fishes. And while the methods and interpretations of these studies vary, they have repeatedly shown us that cichlids show weak but significant integration between their two jaw units, meaning that each is able to specialize evolutionarily, but there is some coordinated evolution that's likely induced by feeding ecology. These studies were super crucial in understanding these patterns in the feeding system, but central to Lean's hypothesis is that idea that the MPJ increased evolutionary independence. So we're really missing uh, insight as to how the MPJ affects the system. Is it increased? Is it decreased independence? Is there no change at all? Okay, so to dig into this, I continued this trend of looking at cichlids, specifically neotropical cichlids as representatives of MPJ fishes. Um, and I compared their evolutionary patterns to those seen in centrarchids or North American sunfishes, another diverse and really well studied group of fishes that do not have that modified pharyngeal jaw. You can see examples of fishes in both of these groups. Cichlids are on top uh, and the centrarchid is on the bottom. And these are cleared and stained specimens where all of the, everything that's in red is bony material and anything in blue is cartilaginous. Before I move on, I wanna note that these two families are not sister groups to each other, but both are continental radiations that have been the subject of previous comparisons uh, that noted really strong ecological and morphological similarities between them. And also because we limit our study to neotropical cichlids, we limit the impact of things like hybridization and lake effects that would definitely have to be taken into account if we looked at African cichlids as well. So building on a previously published data set, morphological data set of neotropical cichlids, uh, we have over 500 cleared and stained specimens uh, representing 85 cichlid species and 30 centrarchid species. And from these specimens, we collected linear me measurements characterizing shape, orientation, functionality of both of our jaw units. In total, we had 24 traits and we performed multiple transformations on this data, ultimately using size corrected and log transform species means to compute and compare evolutionary patterns in these two groups. So we aim to answer two questions here, including how does the MPJ affect patterns of morphological disparity and rates of evolution and patterns of evolutionary integration and independence. Based on Lehm's hypothesis, we would expect increases in both of these cases, but let's just see what we find when we look at this in the comparative framework. Jumping into that morphological disparity and rates of evolution first, 
Uh, here we have a principal components analysis where each point represents a species. Our 30 centrarchids are in this bluish gray color and our 85 cichlid species are in this mauvey brown color. And you can see that there's a little to no overlap in these two groups in morphospace, but we do see some similar axes of variation. Uh, the first is this long axis that goes through both groups, and that essentially captures diversity in oral jaw and craniofacial anatomy. And so here you have species on this far left side uh, that have more elongate, dorsoventrally compressed heads like our Crenocicla and our Micropterus. And on the other end, we have species with more stout head morphologies, such as the Symposodon and the Eniacanthus. So in contrast, our short axis of variation is really highlighting that diversity in pharyngeal jaw anatomy, and it's distinguishing our two groups from each other. We find much thinner, more flexible jaws, typically seen in our centrarchids on that lower half. And then as we shift upwards, we're seeing that both the upper and lower pharyngeal jaws uh, are becoming more robust. And we typically see those in our cichlid species. So we're seeing that both groups are diversifying along similar axes, but are there significant differences here? As you might assume, we do not find significant differences in regards to morphological disparity or the amount of variation that we see in those morphological traits, but we do see a significant difference in rates of evolution. Uh, and we actually see that centrarchids, our fishes without <coughs> the modifications, have two times faster evolution in their feeding traits. Okay. So what do we know so far? We're seeing that our two groups are more similar than they are different. There are similar axes of variation and amounts of variation, uh, but we're also finding that our centrarchids are evolving at a faster rate of evolution or morphological evolution. And that does not support our predictions based on Ling's hypothesis. So at this point, we're seeing an effect of the MPJ in some cases. Uh, but this is not in the way that we anticipated. But I want to go on to look at our the main question here, uh, which is really about evolutionary integration and independence. What is there in an effect of the MPJ on these patterns? So to visualize pairwise evolutionary patterns among the traits, we're going to look at a correlation matrix uh, where our oral jaw traits are aligned with these green bars and our pharyngeal jaw traits are aligned with these gray bars. For this matrix, the top triangle is gonna be cichlid, uh, pairwise relationships in our cichlids. The bottom triangle is our pairwise relationships in centrarchids. And for our scale, uh, our warm colors represent positive correlations, cool colors represent negative correlations. Looking at oral jaw traits first. Each circle here represents the relationship between two oral jaw traits. You can see a lot of variation in correlation strength and direction in both groups. And it can be really cool to sort of really get into what these pairwise relationships are. Uh, but we really have to look at the multivariate covariance structure here to make sense of broad scale patterns. And we can do exactly that using a couple functions in the geomorph Patrick package run in R. So when calculating the strength of integration within the oral jaws, both our cichlids and our centrarchids are showing fairly weak coevolution among these structures. And we don't see a significant difference between our groups either. Turning our attention to the pharyngeal jaws, we only see positive correlations between the upper and the lower pharyngeal jaw structures. And looking back at those multivariate analyses, we find, again, uh, both groups have fairly weak covariance among these prey processing structures, a little bit higher than the oral jaws, but still pretty weak. And we don't see a significant difference between our two groups either. So, so far, the MPJ is not having a major impact on integration within the jaw systems, uh, but let's look at integration across the two systems. So here, each circle represents 
a relationship, a pairwise relationship between one oral jaw trait and one pharyngeal jaw trait. There's some variation in strength in both of our groups, but neither, fam neither family is uh, showing really strong relationships. We're not seeing those deep reds or those deep blues. And looking at the multivariate covariant structure once more, unlike any of our other integration patterns, uh, when you look at integration between the two jaw systems, we are seeing a significant difference between our two groups. And comparing the results from a two block partial least squares analysis, there's not only a significant difference between the two groups, but we're actually seeing that cichlids, our MPJ fishes, are showing stronger coevolution between the oral and the pharyngeal jaws. So to answer that second question, the MPJ is affecting evolutionary independence of the feeding system as a whole, but we're actually seeing the opposite, the exact opposite of what we predicted. Instead of that greater independence in the presence of that modified pharyngeal jaw, we see greater integration of our oral and our pharyngeal jaw structures. Okay, zooming back out to our big questions. What do we know so far? In short, the MPJ is increasing integration between our two jaw units, at least as seen in neotropical cichlids versus centrarchids. And this gives us really strong evidence against Leem's hypothesis. Uh, there's plenty of research showing that the MPJ is impacting trophic diversification or the diversity of uh, prey types that these fishes can access. But based on our results, this novel trait does not increase the diversification of feeding structures. And given this, there's really a need to reevaluate the role of the MPJ uh, in cichlid diversification. There's something going on in this group. They are incredibly speciose, very widespread, ethomorphologically diverse, uh, but it seems like we need to consider the role of things like uh, ecological opportunity, sexual selection and hybridization, especially within African cichlids as key drivers of diversification here. Okay, I'm incredibly proud of this work uh, because it's really the first study to comparatively test Leem's hypothesis, uh, but it really only gives us a glimpse of the impact of the MPJ because we looked at two fish families out of a lot. Uh, and our focus was primarily on morphological patterns. And so to get a more comprehensive understanding of the impact of this trait, uh, I went on to look at how the MPJ affects diversification of prey capture strategies, specifically oral jaw morphologies and motions during feeding. So just to review a couple of things really quick, uh, the modified pharyngeal jaw, or MPJ, is a functional innovation in that independently evolved at least six times. And because we have this, this trait that is resulting in a more robust pharyngeal jaw structure, uh, the fishes that have this MPJ are actually so showing transitions, more transitions to feeding on hard or tough prey items. So another way to think about our question is do MPJ fishes show increased diversification of prey capture strategies to really support that consumption of diverse prey types? If the trait spurs diversification uh, within the oral jaws, we would expect to find more disparity and higher rates of evolution within our morphologies and feeding motions in the oral jaws. So to do this work, I expanded beyond the cichlid and centric paradigm and looked at diversification patterns in fishes with and without the MPJ across a radiation of spiny ring fishes called acanthomorpha. So building on morphometric data sets uh, describing feeding motions in cichlids and reef fishes, uh, I went into our lab's massive collection of high-speed videos that uh, capture section feeding strikes in a really diverse group of fishes, and we collected morphometric data from select feeding videos. Uh, in total, this data set includes 689 strikes, so 689 individual videos 
representing 228 species. We had 133 uh, MPJ fishes from four families where all of the fishes exhibit this modified pharyngeal jaw uh, and 95 species spanning 39 non-MPJ families. So in total, this is one of the largest uh, comparative kinematic data sets of fish feeding to ever be produced. And I'm really excited to look at these patterns in such a broad comparative framework. Let's get into what these videos look like. So you're going to see in just a moment an example of one of these high speed videos where we capture a high effort suction feeding strike at 2000 frames per second. And as I mentioned earlier, this is a process where the oral jaws and the mouth cavity are expanding. They're opening super rapidly and in a coordinated manner to suck in this little prey item. Let's take a look. <laughs> okay, so you just saw that incredibly beautiful. <laughs> The incredibly beautiful feeding sequence where the serranid engulfed that small silver fish using a suction feeding process. And in this data set, again, we have 689 of these videos describing feeding motions across 228 species. So from each of those individual videos, we extracted 10 frames uh, that were spaced equally in time from that closed mouth position all the way through to that maximum gait position. And so when we, when we split up the feeding sequences like this, you can really see a cool, interesting incremental change from the start to the end of that feeding strike. Once we had those 10 frames from a single video, we use landmark morphometrics to track the movements of different anatomical components uh, as the mouth and head change shape during feeding. And in total, there were 18 landmarks placed on each frame. And this is, this is an example of a fish in that maximum gait position. So at the end of the feeding strike, and of those 18 landmarks, uh, 10 were fixed landmarks that were placed on an homologous anatomical points on the head. You can see them outlined here in blue. And then you have eight sliding semi landmarks uh, seen here in purple that were placed on that ventral margin of the fish's head that really capture that shape change that's due to mouth depression during suction feeding. So once all of our frames from the videos are digitized, we use a generalized Procrustes analysis to scale and align the landmarks. And this process results in a single shape coordinate for each frame of the feeding sequence. And we can visualize this in two dimensions within a principal components analysis, uh, where a single point represents head shape at a specific time during the feeding sequence. And when all of the shape coordinates are plotted from each of the 10 sequences, we can model up each of the 10 frames, sorry. We can model a feeding strike as a feeding trajectory that describes the shape change from that closed mouth position up top to that maximum gait position down below. Okay, so this process of video selection, frame selection, landmark placement, and the shape coordinate computation was done for all 689 strikes. And then shape coordinates for each of the 10 frames were averaged by species before visualizing them as feeding trajectories. So we end up with uh, an average feeding trajectory that describes that strike for all 228 species. Okay, so we know what the morphometric data comes from. Let's take a look at these average feeding trajectories where our non-MPJ fishes are gonna be in that gray color and our MPJ fishes will be in gold. This is a lot of data. <laughs> so to orient you, each one of these lines, again, represents that average feeding trajectory for one of our species, uh, where the open circles up at the top 
are the fishes in that closed mouth position and then tracking all the way down to the closed circle uh, at those lower values of PC2. And that is when the fish is at the end of the feeding strike in that maximum gait position. So Paul has some really broad patterns here. PC1 is primarily reflecting differences in starting head shape. So you have more deep body fishes uh, with those deep heads and stout heads on this left side of PC1. And then as you shift over to the right, you have fishes with those more slender elongate heads. And you've probably noticed that the feeding strikes lie almost parallel to PC2. Again, the start of the strikes typically start or, or typically at higher values of PC2, and then they end at those lower values of PC2. And that's what the secondary axis of variation is mainly capturing, an amount of shape change from the start to the end of the strike. So this is a really great and cool way to visualize our data, uh, but this fully dimensional data is too complex for further analyses. We have to break it down uh, into more sensible traits. Uh, so we computed several morphological and functional traits, including interspecific head shape, motion components, and total craniofacial kinesis. For head shape, we use the morphometric data from that very first frame of the feeding strike when the fish is in the closed mouth position. And looking at just one frame, that allows us to get a sense of the morphological variation across all of our species. Next, we computed motion components, and these are functional traits describing very specific motions of the oral jaw bones and the skull during this feeding sequence. We have three linear uh, motion components, including upper jaw protrusion, uh, that mouth depression, uh, and then gape of the oral jaws. And then we have three angular motions, including upper jaw rotation, lower jaw rotation, and that head rotation. Finally, uh, total craniofacial kinesis is the sum of our procrastes distances uh, between each of our successive shape coordinates. And this describes the total amount of shape change that's achieved during a suction feeding event. One, of, one thing that I wanna note just really quickly here uh, is while I represent these traits in two dimensions, uh, the computation of our functional traits and analyses on head shape are run on fully dimensional data, unless I note it later. Okay, so it's important to examine fish morphologies and motions in all these different ways, because there's just so much diversity in these two groups that we're looking at. Uh, this is a broad sampling. Uh, we just have 12 species of the 228 in the data set. Uh, MPJ fishes are in gold, Non-MPJ fishes are in the gray boxes. And for each of these species, there is a picture of the fish in that closed mouth position. That's where we get that starting head shape data from. And then you have the picture of the fish in that maximum gait position at the end of the feeding strike. In these images, there's variation in protrusion, uh, head size and shape, uh, the amount of gait, the amount of cranial rotation, Again, I can go on and on about the ways that there's variation here, uh, but let's look at this data in a quantitative format, including our PCAs and a density plot. It's easy to get bogged down by all of this information, but what I want you to take away from this is that in every single case, our fishes with the generic pharyngeal jaws have higher disparity than those with the modified pharyngeal jaws. We have about three times more diversity in head shape and motion components overall in the MPJ versus, or in the non-MPJ versus MPJ fishes. And we have over four times more disparity in kinesis. Again, this is the opposite of what we predicted. <laughs> we expected that if that specialized pharyngeal jaw is a key innovation that spurs diversification, there'd be greater disparity among MPJ fishes in every single one of these cases. Okay, going back to our question. So although the MPJ is allowing fishes to access more diverse prey types, there's less disparity in oral jaw morphologies and motions. <coughs> our next step though is to account for time. 
Uh, since non-MPJ fishes are older, they could have just accumulated all of this diversity uh, over the long history of the group. So to look at rate patterns, I estimated rates of state dependent evolution using the muskrat model in web base. Uh, and this model allows us to determine if a discrete character, in this case, the modified pharyngeal jaw, presence or absence of this modification, uh, significantly impacts continuous character evolution. And unlike other rate models, uh, muskrat accounts for background rate variation or rate variation that's due to factors other than our discrete trait. So we can really get an idea of, or we can really see the true impact of the modified pharyngeal jaw on rates of evolution. Uh, we looked at, looked for evidence of state dependent evolution in by running three separate muskrat models on head shape uh, using PC data, uh, all six motion components and kinesis. Interestingly, we only find evidence for state-dependent evolution regarding total craniofacial kinesis. And despite having more time to accumulate diversity, our MPJ fishes, non-MPJ fishes, are showing two times more, or two times faster evolution in kinesis. So revisiting our question one more time, we see that the MPJ fishes uh, show less disparity in these traits. And we are also seeing that they have slower rates of evolution regarding that total amount of shape change during a feeding strike. Once again, <laughs> this is the opposite of what we predicted. And now we just, having looked at these evolutionary patterns in feeding motions, and morphologies across a really broad sample of fishes, there's a surprising story that is emerging here. I'm still of the mindset that the MPJ is a functional innovation because we have that increase in the diversity of consumable prey types. Uh, but it's clear that this trait is also constraining diversification in some ways within the feeding system. So I think naturally the next question that we have to ask is why? Why is there more restricted evolution in form and function despite uh, the ability to access more diverse prey types? The first thing that we have to consider is functional trade-offs. Novel phenotypes that impact performance uh, are subject to trade-offs. And in this case, the modification, the modifications to the prey processing system are allowing that expansion into durophagy and various forms of herbivory. Uh, but this comes with a restricted pharyngeal gait, uh, and that reduces the frequency of piscivory uh, on, or feeding on other fishes. Break that down a little bit. If you take a cross section of the fish head where the pharyngeal jaws are, uh, MPJ fishes, because they have more robust uh, pharyngeal jaw structures, um, there's a much smaller gate. There's a much smaller area in there uh, to crush and tear more rugged foods. And the consequence of that is that as you reduce uh, that gate size, you're also reducing your ability to feed on larger prey items like other fishes. If we go back to our density plot of kinesis, uh, the eight species with the highest kinesis values are piscivores. So they're feeding on other fishes and seven out of the eight of those fishes, out of the eight of those species are non-MPJ species. So functional trade-offs are very likely at play here. Second, because diet is imposing similar selection pressures on the oral and the pharyngeal jaws, I think that co-evolution of the two jaw systems is really key to our story. And this takes us back to that first project that we discussed where we have stronger integration in our MPJ fishes. Again, instead of that decoupling of the two jaw systems, the MPJ resulted in stronger integration that was likely brought on by correlated responses to specific prey types. And as I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of discussion around the impact of strong versus weak integration, but assuming that the patterns that we saw in our two groups uh, hold true across broader samplings of MPJ and non-MPJ fishes, 
uh, stronger integration is really constraining the diversification of form and function within the feeding system. I think you can most clearly visualize this when you look back at the PCAs and the density plots of our traits. MPJ fishes are repeatedly evolving into uh, very specific areas of morpho and functional space. Uh, and if you look closely, there's only a couple places where MPJ fishes have more extreme functional capacity. And that just underscores that there is likely constraint in this system. Okay, to wrap this up, I want us to zoom back out to functional innovations more broadly. Uh, the way that we previously talked about these traits is that they have a positive impact on diversification within the lineages that they evolved in. But if there's anything that I want you to take away from this talk is that the impact of novel traits may be more nuanced because the functional capacity of any system is not unlimited. Any major trait change can expand and increase performance in some ways, uh, but it can also restrict it in other ways. And so novel traits may positively or negatively impact diversification. And the only way to understand uh, the impacts of these innovations is to continue to continue doing comparative studies uh, like the ones that I have described here today. <laughs> okay, so I am beyond excited to continue uh, doing work like this in my postdoc uh, with Ole Seehausen at the University of Bern. Uh, his lab group works to understand what factors underlie biodiversity in fishes, uh, and they have a big focus on the adaptive radiation of African cichlids. So I'm really looking forward to joining this group in January. Uh, but before I get to that, I have a lot of people that I want to give uh, a big, big thank you to. Uh, of course, I want to thank my many funding sources. Uh, without the conference funding, research funds, fellowships, None of this work would have been possible at all. And I'm also very thankful to the curators and collections managers at so many museums for providing me hundreds of specimens to complete this work. Um, there aren't <laughs> enough words to really express the gratitude that I have for my advisor, Peter Wainwright. Um, after six years under your really active and intentional mentorship, I've become a better researcher and collaborator and science community member than I ever could have imagined that I would be. And I also wanna thank my QE committee members who really helped me to fine tune my questions and think critically about the big picture that my research fits into. This is especially true of my dissertation committee members, uh, Stacey Combs and Annie Schmidt, who went on to be just incredibly helpful members of my dissertation committee incredibly helpful mentors. <laughs> um, I owe a lot of my success to my lab mates. Uh, you all have been by my side throughout this entire process, every single step of the way. I'm really grateful for all the professional relationships that I have with all of you all and the extraordinary friendships that we've developed over the last um, six years. Um, I'm really grateful to my collaborators on all the projects I've worked on, but especially those on my dissertation chapters, um, Jen Hodge, Prasanta Chakrabarti, uh, Ed Burris, and my former undergrad, now UC Davis graduate, Brian Lamb, uh, Catherine Korn, and Chris Martinez. I've learned so much from each of you, and I would not have been able to complete these projects without all of your guidance. Uh, I'm super grateful to be able to have <laughs> uh, gone through this whole process and learned alongside uh, my amazing cohort mates. This is a really wonderful group of people and I'm so excited to see what each of us does in the coming years. Uh, more broadly, it's been a real privilege to be a part of Pop Bio, UC Davis, and Friday Harbor Lab communities. Uh, the folks in, in these communities really create such a safe space and uh, supportive space to grow and learn in. Uh, and I wanna give a shout out, they're not pictured here, but the Eve administrative staff and the custodial team who take care of so much behind the scenes that really allows us to do what we want to do, the research and all the other stuff. 
So in addition to my research, what Peter mentioned earlier, I had the extraordinary opportunity to found and facilitate several DEI programs and uh, initiatives over the past six years. Uh, these programs have given me such a positive outlook or outlet and really shaped who I am as a DEI practitioner. Um, I'm especially grateful to Hannah Iguera, uh, Elena Sulia, and Carmen Banks for their dedication, their partnership with me, and, and just leading several of these programs. Uh, I had the support of so many friends and uh, yeah, friends near and far. Uh, we had a lot of game nights, adventures, uh, midtown church group meetups, wedding reunion, a lot of weddings. Um, <laughs> potlucks, phone calls, all of it has just carried me through the last six years. Um, and of course, I would not be where I am or who I am today without my family. You all have lifted me up in prayer and encouraged me and celebrated me. Um, you spoke spoken greatness over my life for so long now. Um, my PhD is a huge accomplishment. But my biggest is making you all proud and living a life that I know you sacrificed so much for me to have. And lastly, I want to thank my husband, Eli. Um, your friendship and partnership bring so much joy to my life. And I couldn't have done any of this without your support and love. I want to thank you all. For <laughs> Bravo. Great job, Alexis. We love you. <laughs> yeah, Alexis, uh, I was wondering if there were any sex differences and morphology added that showed up on any of the PC components. In what differences in morphology? As sex differences. Sex differences. I did not look at that. That would be a really great. I. Yeah. I focus on the bones. <laughs> <laughs> so I did not look at that, but that would definitely be something um, to think about in these studies. Most of my focus went into making sure that I was using adult specimens uh, because there can be a lot of differences as fishes grow. So over ontogeny. Uh, so that's where my focus was. Will definitely be naive. <laughs> so, um, so you've talked a lot about morphological diversification, which is that's you know when people naively think of cichlids, they think of species diversification, the yes. numbers of species or speciation rates or mm -hmm. whatever. You wanted to, to say anything about that? I have for not your, for your what did you work at? I have not looked at species diversification. That would be something that Nick is doing. Yes. <laughs> tune in, tune in next quarter. Um, yeah, I've mostly focused on the morphology and the functions There's within these. Plenty. Yes. <laughs> there are a lot of people that look at species diversification though. Um, I don't know if they have connected the MPJ to that specifically. You have any? ideas about what they might find if they did? I think that they would be underwhelmed. <laughs> <laughs> I, think that, I think that the MPJ is, I think that those modifications are huge and just allowing fishes to eat different things. Uh, again, algae, mollusks, we have sifters, and you just see more of those uh, types of trophic ecologies in our MPJ groups. Um, but I don't, I don't think that it's impacting species diversification. Cool. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Please join me in another.